four continents, nine countries, six airlines, and 10 flights. Join me for this epic trip around the world. Today's journey will take us from the US down under to New Zealand and Australia before flying 10 hours straight north to Japan and onwards to Korea. From there, we'll fly to China and continue to Dubai before heading to Europe and ultimately heading back to the US to complete this round the world circuit. How much did this whole adventure cost and which flights were the best and worst along the journey? Come along to find out. Today's adventure starts in Houston, Texas, where I'm about to embark on a very long day, or should I say night of travel. My final destination on this first ticket is Sydney, but I also get to enjoy the torture of touching down in one of my favorite countries I've ever traveled to and then leave two hours later, so that's fun. Both of these first flights are operated by Air New Zealand and their classic 777-300ER. This aircraft features 44 business class seats and a one-to-one -one layout that is definitely the worst you'll see on all these flights, ironically. Still, it's not a bad seat and I'm grateful to have it for this first 15-hour flight. But as we get further into the video, you'll see how seats have evolved since this was introduced in the 2000s. Our flight is almost completely full and we start our journey off being delayed by an hour and a half. As someone who starts falling asleep whenever I'm awake past 11 p.m., our takeoff time of midnight is perfect, mainly because I'm pretty sure I'll get good sleep to start this long journey. Not before we have some dinner though. The good thing here as dinner starts is that this is probably the second worst catering out of all my flights, so we're getting this over with quickly. That's because US-based catering is generally worse than the rest of the world, and this flight is no exception. Air New Zealand serves meals beautifully, at least, and we get to enjoy a healthy three-course meal, well besides this delicious plant-based brownie for dessert. At this point, it's 2 a.m., so needless to say, I am ready for some sleep. Air New Zealand has some nice amenity kits, and it will be very interesting to compare the ones I get along this journey. This kit is made from some sort of thick paper and contains some nice products, including some quirky socks, but lacks probably the most important thing on an overnight flight, an eye mask. Honestly, I don't have any problems falling asleep anyway because the crew flip over my seat and turn it into, surprisingly, the most comfortable business class bed on this entire journey. Why? Because the bedding is so great between a thick mattress pad, a luscious pillow, and a nice cover. You also have no space restrictions by your feet, which is really appreciated in this situation. I end up spending an insane 10 hours in bed, most of it is spent sleeping, but a few parts are disturbed by turbulence, and then I'm finally woken up for breakfast as we get close to New Zealand. The fact I was able to get so much rest will be amazing to prevent me from catching a cold or getting too exhausted on a journey like this. The breakfast here isn't too bad, but the main thing I appreciate is the large quantity of food, given that the flight is almost 15 hours. At this point, it's lunchtime back in the US. I'm so excited as we touch down in Auckland, even though it's dark and dreary because I can't believe I'm back in New Zealand. I couldn't care less about the weather. I don't care about anything besides the fact that I unfortunately have to leave so soon. Happy that there's a ceiling at least. Thankfully, transiting in Auckland is quite easy, so you get off, go through transit security, and then I can head up to the Air New Zealand Lounge, which is an absolute zoo this time of day. I quickly realize, okay, this is not a good place to spend time when you have such a nice modern terminal you can sit in instead, so I do the most important thing, request a shower so I can wash off after that long flight. The wait isn't too long, so I'm out of the lounge and heading to my gate pretty soon after. So if that was the proof you needed that frequent flyer lounges often aren't worth it, there it is. I mean, the terminal is so calm, quiet, so much seating, such good views. The only reason to go to the lounge is to have a tiny bit of food, if even that, and of course, take a shower.
The next flight to Sydney will take three hours and is operated by the exact same aircraft type. Again, the flight is delayed by an hour, which doesn't matter too much since I have a few days to spend in Australia, so I'm not in a hurry to catch the next flight. I'm excited to see what a shorter flight is like on Air New Zealand and review the experience in daylight. As we board, you can see how nicely Air New Zealand utilizes mood lighting, which is especially nice since the cabin and walls are white. Again, there's a pillow waiting at our seat and we even get to enjoy a bit of pre-departure service as I peruse the menu and we push back towards Sydney. This flight is full and it's funny to think that many people are connecting and will be finishing their journey in Australia, while mine has only just begun. I enjoy not one, but two delicious juices before my breakfast, because why not? If they have it, might as well try it. Next up, the breakfast service, which this time is catered from New Zealand. It's quite an interesting mix of different products and flavors, and again, the portion is good given that it's just a three hour flight. To be a little bit critical, this is the third breakfast I'm being offered this morning. Considering I ate one on the last flight a few hours prior, then was served breakfast in the lounge, and now this. It would just be nice to have an option for something else to eat since breakfast is infamously the worst airplane meal. I spent most of this flight working since I'm well rested after the previous one and before I know it, we start our descent into Sydney. It's such a beautiful day down here and I am so excited to get off this plane and breathe some fresh air trying to adjust to this time zone given the massive time difference from the US before it's time to head onwards to Korea via Japan. To think that this journey has only just begun. After this long journey, I still take the time to head to the gym in Sydney. That's because I know my personal trainer, Devin, will be checking in on me if he sees I haven't been to the gym in a few days. My trainer is actually traveling with me on this trip. Kind of. He's with me on my phone through Copilot, today's video sponsor that I've been using for almost a year now. If you struggle with gym consistency, falling off the wagon, not knowing where to start, Copilot is for you. When you join, you get assigned a personal trainer based on your needs and preferences, who then proceeds to make you custom workouts based on what equipment is available to you and what your goals are. Copilot's trainers are college educated in health and fitness, so I know that the workouts Devin makes for me are science back. It's so amazing as someone who doesn't always have access to the same gym or sometimes doesn't have access to a gym at all to have an app like Copilot with a trainer like Devin who makes me custom workouts based on whatever is available where I am in the world. Basically, I just send Devin a message or a video of what's available at the gym where I am and the next morning when I wake up, I have a workout ready in Copilot. So then all I need to do is start the workout and I don't have to think about anything. I just follow the full workout instructions in the Copilot app or on my Apple Watch and what's so amazing to me is that Devin keeps me accountable. Truly, Copilot is worth it just for the accountability it adds to your life, and that doesn't even factor in the physical changes you'll see. Check out Copilot at the link at the top of the description, or go to go.mycopilot.com slash nonstop Dan to get a 14-day free trial with your very own personal trainer. As a bonus, you can also get 20% off your first month if you sign up by February 1st. After some of the best days of 2023 spent in wonderful Sydney, it is time to head onwards on one of my favorite airlines, ANA. So how will this next flight be where it's 10 hours from Sydney to Tokyo with a quick overnight before flying from Tokyo to Seoul the next morning? Well, let's find out. 
after so many years, I finally get to take you guys along to fly what I at least think is one of my favorite airlines in the world, but I haven't flown them nearly as many times as Singapore Airlines or Qatar, so it's always up to the test. Sydney Airport is an absolute breeze and I make it through in no time, but pretty much right away, it's time to board my ANA 787-9. This is also Oscar's first ever flight on Annie. I am so, so excited for the Japanese accents. <laughs> This is the seat you'll see on at least one other airline in this round the world adventure, so it's always fun to compare how the airlines customize them and how the final product ends up being as a consequence. As you'll see, I don't think this seat could be any more different in its design on the two airlines that feature it on this itinerary. This specific aircraft has 40 business class seats in a one-to-one -one configuration, and although the 787 is a much narrower plane than the 777, this seat notably feels much more spacious than the one on Air New Zealand. Although I haven't flown ANA as much as some of my other favorite airlines like Singapore Airlines, I always feel at home when I'm boarding and I hear the beautiful ANA music. Naturally, with ANA being a Japanese airline, these are the flights with the most polished service. Being Japanese also, of course, means they are experts at amenities. Waiting at your seat, you have slippers, a shoehorn, and a shoe bag, as well as a pretty small amenity kit. Don't worry though, if there's anything missing, there is an enormous box of amenities in the galley. One of the most fun things on ANA is their menu, which has so many unique things, such as a coffee journal in the sky. I'm still not quite sure what that is. So we depart beautiful, sunny Australia, heading straight north. Any catering out of Sydney is interesting with a quinoa salad appetizer and some gyoza as our main course. That's not quite enough though, so I also order some of a &A's delicious plant-based ramen and corn soup. I swear these two items alone are reason enough to fly ANA, and they are some of the most delicious things you can eat on a plane. Seriously, do not sleep on this corn soup because it's at least as good as the ramen. Now while the previous flight was 15 hours, the ironic thing is that this 10 hour flight feels so much longer. I think it comes down to the other one being spent mostly sleeping while this is a daytime flight and I am trying to adjust to the time zone so I can't just sleep the flight away. Instead, I have to spend pretty much the entire flight working and when you're stationary in a chair for 10 hours, that feels like a heck of a long work day. I found this flight and my upcoming flight from Shanghai to Dubai to be the most challenging just due to the flight times and how I had to stay awake, meaning it felt like time was passing especially slowly. As the sun sets and we start approaching Tokyo, it's time for another meal, this time some delicious kimchi fried rice. This is the kind of comfort food you want after 10 hours of sitting in the same spot, but I'm not gonna lie, I am very excited to get off and have a real nice sleep before a much shorter flight the next day. The next morning is spent at the ANA lounge, which is just as much of a zoo as the Air New Zealand lounge, but here the food is definitely better. I enjoy some Inari sushi and some other little snacks, but if you want, they have a whole a la carte menu with different types of ramen, curry, etc. This next flight is operated by a smaller Boeing 787-8, which is almost half business class. This seat is just so slightly different from the 787-9, and to be honest, I prefer this one, even though it looks a bit more military-esque, shall we say? This is just a two-hour hop over to Seoul, but even so, the crew distribute a selection of amenities, because why not? As we push back and depart for Seoul, I just think about how I love the feeling of boarding ANA. It feels like you're on board a spaceship somehow, it just feels so safe and comforting.
The views of Tokyo on departure are absolutely stunning, and we even get to see Mount Fuji. Now, the service today is understandably a bit more simple, but that doesn't mean it's bad. I enjoy some of ANA's signature drink, which is so good, and then my vegetarian oriental meal is served. This meal is extremely delicious, and what a great portion for a flight this length. Given the short flight time and the quite elaborate meal, there isn't much time to work before we begin our descent into Seoul and touch down at Gimpo Airport at a remote stand. Now it's time for me and Oscar to enjoy Korea for a few days. I have such a special connection to this city and this country. Having spent a semester living here in 2018 and every time we come back, Oscar and I have our soul routine which never gets tired and involves a lot of eating. This time it also involves a color theory consultation and all types of other fun stuff that you can check out on our channel Oscar and Dan before it's time to head on a different type of adventure, this time on China Eastern. Honestly, I don't know if this part of the trip is my favorite or my least favorite. It's one or the other for many different reasons. So the Chinese airline I am flying today is China Eastern. And let me tell you, the experience has already been a huge headache and we haven't even started. First of all, I got an incredible deal in cash for the leg from Seoul to Dubai, paying just $700 one way in business class. Unfortunately, China Eastern's website is dysfunctional, to say the least, and the whole experience leading up to the flight is extremely chaotic and disappointing. Now that we're finally here in Seoul though, let's board our 777-300ER for the one and a half hour hop over to Shanghai. This aircraft has 52 business class seats on China Eastern, all in sand colored tones. This plane and the plane I have a connection on in Shanghai could not be more different. This cabin feels comfortable, modern, and the seats are just what you need for a one and a half hour flight. Just kidding, obviously this would be amazing for a 15 hour flight as well, but luckily that's not what's awaiting today. There are some pre-departure hot towels, a cute safety video, a wrapped magazine, and a cool drink menu. Seoul is rainy and gray today as it was for most of my stay this time around, but don't worry, we blast off in our mighty 777, the third one on this trip already, and in no time the seatbelt sign is off and I can walk around and explore the beautiful China Eastern cabin. The airline provides some nicely wrapped slippers as well, even for short flights, and has a delicious selection of drinks which are served with another hot towel. The meal service on this flight looks like my personal nightmare, so it's nothing I choose to indulge in, especially given that soon I'll be able to have some excellent food, at least I hope so if China lets us in. That's because China offers transit visas for many people around the world who would usually need to apply for a visa to enter. With a transit visa, you can stay for up to five days in certain cities and that includes Shanghai. This applies if you're booked on the same ticket like I am here, but also if you're booked on separate tickets in and out of China, which is what I've used before COVID. This is my first time using the transit visa service since COVID and thankfully Oscar and I are let in, so we get to enjoy 24 of our best hours of 2023 in Shanghai. You can go around the world, you can go to a lot of different places, but China, even though we've been here quite a few times, still feels like one of the most exotic. <laughs> If there's one video I recommend you watch from here, it's our vlog from our day in Shanghai, because although we've spent quite a bit of time here before, it is so fun and refreshing to get to go here again after all these years, and honestly, it was really sad to have to leave so soon. Getting to Shanghai Pudong for departure the next day ahead of our 10 hour flight to Dubai, I'm not gonna lie, I'm surprised by how luxurious the China Eastern check-in experience is. You can take a seat while they take care of you, they have water to drink, and once you're through and head to the lounge, that's also a pretty nice space with a big selection of food as well. 
This flight, although it's much longer, is operated by a much smaller plane than the last one, an E330-200. Basically the size of the 787-8 I flew from Tokyo to Seoul. The demand for this route doesn't seem to be very low though since our flight is pretty much sold out. It's so interesting to see in how many ways this flight is a polar opposite of my upcoming connection on Emirates A380. And as we board, I think we can all see the difference between this cabin and the cabin I had on my previous China Eastern flight. At least Oscar and I are traveling together so we don't need to sit next to a stranger and again, although this is quite basic as far as business class goes, I am just so grateful to be sitting in business class because it could be a lot worse doing the same round the world journey and economy. And before I give you any ideas, that's not something you're gonna see on this channel. I like torturing myself but in other ways. This flight again begins with a different type of juice and a hot towel followed by a look through the menu which is very convoluted. That's because it covers the entire year with different color-coded pages. So remember on Air New Zealand when I said we were going to have two flights with bad food? Well, this is the other one. Honestly, I wasn't even expecting to get a special meal on this flight since there were a lot of problems ordering it, but here we have it. It doesn't look great, but I'm very grateful for it and I eat it anyway because I know it's going to be a long day. I also drink this radioactive wastewater, which is actually some kind of mint soda that tastes really good. This flight has the most challenging interaction with the crew of the whole trip because there's a huge communication barrier. The worst thing though is that after the meal, the crew forces everyone to close their window shades, which is really tough given the length of my journey and the state of my body at this point. When you're flying long distance in daylight, the most important thing to help your body adjust to time zones and to stay awake is daylight. So when you're forced to close the window shades and pretty much sleep, that is not good for your circadian rhythm, but I gotta say the bed is quite comfortable here. Later on in the flight, I unbox our cute little amenity kit, which I now add to my enormous collection that is pretty much overflowing in my hand luggage at this point. And guess what? There's even a pre-arrival meal. Listen, I'm so excited to hop off this plane. This is the definition of an exhausting travel day since we spent the whole morning walking around Shanghai, where we had an absolute blast to be fair. The sun is setting as we touch down in Dubai, ready to leave for an aircraft and airline I will never say no to flying, an A380 on Emirates. So you know what's coming, this aircraft and airline do not need an introduction. I will be spending only six and a half hours on here today, flying up to Frankfurt. Check-in is a breeze as is heading through security before spending some quality time in the enormous Emirates Business Class Lounge. This specific one is at the A-Gates. Emirates lounges are sort of like their own terminals, so you don't have a traditional lounge feeling, but if you think back at the previous lounges, my biggest complaint was overcrowding. Well, that is certainly solved here. Another amazing feature of these lounges is that certain gates let you board directly from the lounge. That applies to my A380 flight today as well. This will be my first flight on a double-decker on this round-the-world trip, so it'll be nice for variety, I think. Most people who have flown the A380 would probably say if there was an option to fly around the world only on this aircraft, they would choose it. And of course, since I'm the one who said that, I definitely feel that way. Now, do you guys recognize this seat? Well, it's pretty much the same one we had on a a but as you can tell, the finishes pretty much couldn't be more different. Which one do you prefer? Honestly, for me, life is short and a flight is even shorter, so why not enjoy these finishes and just have a fun time going all out with the gaudiness? There are even drinks in your mini bar at this seat, which is more of a gimmick than anything, but a great reminder to stay hydrated on long flights. And I also have to say, after flying 777s, 787s, and A330s, boarding an A380 just feels like such a relief because you have this sense of space. 
All of these flights have been in business class, but tell me another aircraft type where you can get an enormous full-on social space like this. Yeah, the bar really makes any flight fly by. So today I have a pre-departure wellness juice and a hot towel. Is anyone counting how many juices and hot towels I've had so far on this trip? Interestingly, because of our morning departure, Emirates serves breakfast after takeoff and then lunch before landing. This is kind of nice because it means a quick meal to start the flight so you can either sleep through it or work, and then eat a real meal before you're ready to start the day at your destination. The reason I'm okay with having breakfast is that Emirates has some of my favorite catering in the world out of Dubai, and I always feel like the food is high quality, the portions are good, and the dishes are creative. I mean, how delicious does this avocado, chili, and grilled peach salad look? This is my idea of a nice breakfast. Again, since this is a daytime flight, I need to be working, not sleeping, but I always check out the bed and Emirates usually passes out mattress pads after takeoff, which is very dangerous when you're tired and trying to resist not falling asleep. The bigger problem is that at this point, I could probably fall asleep pretty much anywhere. An interesting thing when flying these airlines back to back is that you begin to appreciate the more Anglo-centric airlines when you come from Anglo-speaking countries, largely because of the in-flight entertainment. Of course, different airlines mainly cater their entertainment to their local markets. So if like me, or I know the majority of you guys usually at least watching my videos are from a Western country, you appreciate airlines that have maybe more American, British, and Eurocentric entertainment options. And let me tell you, being such a global airline, Emirates is one of the best of all. That's because they have a huge Western selection, but also so many options from literally every corner of the world. It's like a huge buffet of entertainment, which feels extra luxurious after all their previous flights. With six flights down, it's pretty amazing this is the first one I've had a coffee on, but Emirates has such a nice little coffee service, along with some snacks that I cannot resist. Today's meal consists of some delicious heated bread, a fresh salad with pomegranate seeds, and this mushroom and quinoa dish. The main course is stuffed pasta, which might not look very special, but is oh so delicious. And then everything is rounded off with not one, but two slices of plant-based cake, mainly to make up for what I've missed on previous flights. It's good I've been doing a lot of walking on my layovers in Sydney, Seoul, and Shanghai, because yeah, this flight is an indulgence. I head to the bathroom to brush my teeth for the first time during this journey. Just kidding, can you imagine? And then have a bite of Turkish delight right before we touch down in Frankfurt. By the way, I can't believe I didn't acknowledge this until now, but how awesome is it that I got to fly the destination Dubai livery because this is probably the most eye-catching airline livery in the world. We only have one real flight left I'm going to show you here, and why do I say real? Well, first we have a flight up to Gothenburg, and that is on Lufthansa's A320. Not gonna lie, I think we all know how depressing it would be seeing an intra-European one and a half hour business class flight after all these flights we've had. I mean, just think back at Auckland to Sydney, Tokyo to Seoul, Seoul to Shanghai. It would just be too tragic comparing those flights, which were similar lengths, to what you get here in Europe, which is basically an economy seat with the middle seat blocked. Once in Gothenburg though, after spending a quick three days there with family, it is time to head back to North America on the final leg of this journey. Although this is the last flight, it's the most important and significant of all the flights I took in 2023 because it's the very first direct flight from Gothenburg to New York, a route that has already been discontinued since recording this video. As if I needed one more reason to have built up resentment toward Gothenburg. <laughs> if you don't know what I'm talking about, check out the On Air podcast. Now things get pretty funky and crazy because we have flown all length of flights on different wide body aircraft, but this is an almost nine hour flight on a narrow body. 
specifically an Airbus A321LR. At the front of this plane, there are 22 business class seats that share one bathroom and one tiny galley. It's insane that this airplane is serving a flight longer than the A380 I just flew because the size difference is very noticeable, even though I gotta say it, the seat on this plane is really freaking good. These seats are private, and again, the finishes are very different from previous airlines, but I like them. Waiting at the seat, there's also a blanket, pillow, and a nice amenity kit with a beach-themed kind of vibe. This flight leaves Sweden at 6 p.m., getting into New York at 9 p.m., which is quite unusual timing for transatlantic flights, and it also means that for the last time in this round-the-world trip, I will be pushing my body clock to the extremes. We take off on a beautiful evening and I get to work straight away because when you only have one tiny galley to serve 22 customers quite an elaborate business class meal, the problem is that it takes forever regardless of how many crew members there are. Okay, I know you're thinking, let's get on with it. This has been a long video. So yeah, let's eat on this final flight. I've literally never had catering on SAS that I've thought, hmm, this is good, but luckily this flight breaks that streak. For some reason, perhaps because I hadn't flown SAS in a while before this, the food game seems to have really been stepped up with my appetizer, which is gorgeous. Then a delicious and spicy tempeh curry that's honestly so spicy, I cannot believe they're serving this on a Scandinavian airline and finally a bit of a letdown for dessert. Again, it's a long daytime flight and I struggle to figure out if I should sleep on this one considering we arrive in New York at bedtime. Instead, I spend much of the flight working but finally I can't stay awake any longer so I recline my seat into bed mode and take a nap. Bed mode is when you really notice you're in a smaller and tighter plane than the previous ones, but it's a non-stop route that wouldn't have been possible with larger aircraft, so you have to keep that in consideration. The sad thing though is that SAS is relocating these aircraft to fly from Copenhagen to New York, which is completely against the whole point of the A321LR. That also means everyone who would have been on an A330 from Copenhagen to New York will now have a worse experience. Just after waking up from my nap and not long after the previous meal, it is time for another bite and the final meal of this journey. I wonder how many kilos of airplane food I've eaten now. Which flight do you think had the best looking food? We finally touched down in a rainy, dreary New York City and although this video actually started in Houston, I had flown down from New York prior to my Air New Zealand flight. I don't really see the point in including a domestic US flight in this, but it does make me think it would be a cool video comparing different domestic flights in different regions. As a reminder, don't forget to check out Copilot to get 14 days free and 20% off your first month if you sign up by February 1st. And if you want a detailed rundown on how I paid for these flights using points that anyone anywhere can use, make sure to enter your email at the link at the top of the description and I'll be sending you a free rundown of each of these flights how I booked them and how you can do the same. I also have to give a shout out to Trek Trendy for inspiring this video with similar adventures he does in first class. Now it is time for some non-stop rest, so I'll see you guys in the next video and until then, fly safe. <laughs>